Good morning. Happy New Year. I see a few of you made it out of bed, stayed up late. Maybe you like me, tucked in by 10.30. 7.30. Even better. So I want to thank Pastor Mateo for preaching on Christmas morning. That was great. It was uh, good to remember the birth of our Lord, and it uh, helped me remember as I wandered into our guest bathroom the inaccuracy of the nativity set that I had with the three kings visiting the baby Jesus in the manger. Whoops. So you can't always get it right. So um, anyway, I'm Pastor uh, Nate Thompson. So would you join me in prayer as we open? So our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Just another Sunday to worship you, our risen Savior. Thank you that you came and you died and that you rose again and that you have ascended to the right hand of the Father. God, thank you. Thank you for the salvation that we have in your Son. Thank you that we get to worship you. Thank you that we get to praise you in song, in scripture reading, in prayer, in teaching, in listening. Lord, thank you for all of these things. You are so good to us. I pray that you'd be with us now, that you'd attend your word, that it would convey what you would have for your people, and that you would use me as you would. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So one day, a little girl, about five years old, heard a ranting preacher praying most lustily till the roof rang with the strength of his supplication. Turning to her mother and beckoning the maternal ear down to a speaking place, she whispered, Mother, don't you think that if, you li he, if he lived nearer to God, he wouldn't have to talk so loud? <laughs> so is, that's pretty accurate. Um, even from the mouths of babes, sometimes there's a wrong understanding of prayer. And as I was assessing what I would like to preach on this first day of the new year, I thought prayer would be appropriate that as we step into this new year, we would remember anew, what is prayer? How do we pray? And focus in on those things. And perhaps in 23, maybe something you can resolve to do is to pray more. Something that we're all called to as believers. So our text from, uh, for this morning will be in Matthew chapter 6. So if you'd turn there, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 5 to 15. And this is in a section called the Beatitudes. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this area in the book of Matthew, it starts in chapter 5, it goes to chapter 7. Uh, Jesus' audience are his disciples, and there appears to be a crowd who, at the end of chapter 7, marvels because he speaks as one having authority. So Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15, we're going to keep a very simple outline, uh, three points. Uh, we're going to look at what is prayer, focus mainly on verses 5 through 8, and then we will focus on how to pray, verses 8 through 15, and then lastly, we'll make some observations on prayer, kind of points of application. So let's go ahead and read Starting in verse 5, it says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. So a good way of starting out in what prayer is, is to assess what prayer is not. And what prayer is not, is it's not self-focused. It's not about me. It's not about gaining attention or approval from others. So Jesus mentions here, he, he talks about these hypocrites. 
says, don't pray as the hypocrites. And he doesn't say the Pharisees or the scribes or the religious leaders. He says the hypocrites. And there's various meanings of this, this word in Greek. It's a good uh, word to use here, hypocrite. It, it's, here, it's just best understand, uh, understood to be a pretender, a person who's pretending. And what are they pretending to do? They're pretending to talk to God. But that's not who they're talking to. They're actually talking to anybody but God because they want to be noticed. That's what he calls out. They're praying in such a way that they're noticed by others. And, and our Lord says, the reward is gained in full already. They get it. So prayer is not self-focused. It's not to be used for approval by others. There's an absence there of addressing the very person that prayer should involve. It's God himself. So that's what prayer is not. Skip down to verse 7. We'll also look at what prayer is not here. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So what prayer is not? It's not manipulation. It's not manipulating God. It's not treating God as something other than He has declared Himself to be. And notice who the audience is here. Don't pray as the, now it's the Gentiles. So these would be people who what? Don't know God. And worship a God of their own device of their own imagination as they make up who they think God is. And usually it's some man-made version of God. And any man-made version of God is a God that can be manipulated, controlled. So the more beautiful the speech, the more eloquent the words, the more God's going to pay attention. Or the more um, pleading I can be in my um, words or or phrases, the more he's more likely to miss, listen to me. So that again is not what prayer is. It's not about me, and it's not about praying to a God of my own device, or of my own devices, or of my own imagination. So what is prayer? What is prayer? So let's back, back up to verse 6. It says, but when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So first, I just want to make the acknowledgement that this is not an indictment against public prayer. That's something that we just did. And our Lord publicly prayed. So this isn't a problem or this isn't a challenge against public prayer. We're contrasting two ideas. What was the problem with the first group, with the person that we were addressing in verse 5? It wasn't whether or not they were praying. It was why they were praying. The heart, the motivation behind it, it was self, self-centered, self-focused. So notice all the phrasing in here. We've got inner room, we've got close the door, we've got in secret. We've got these words that describe very private, very quiet circumstance. And he's doing that to paint a picture. Because who's left in the room now? Who's there? I'm there. I hope you're there. If you're not there, we need to talk. You should be there, yes. Who else is there? There's only one other person there. It's God. So the focus here is that it's about God. It's solely about God and talking to God. No one else is around. No one else is there. And notice the phrasing. Pray to who? Pray to your Father. Your Father. It's not, oh, great, high, and majestic. 
no, no, no verbosity, no eloquence, but an intimacy, a real intimacy, a relationship that is genuinely there, that genuinely exists, and it's tender, compassionate, and it's focused upward, vertically, not horizontally, vertically, towards God. So it's contrasted to those that are hypocritical. So prayer is about a single audience. Even in public prayer, mind you, prayer is about a single audience. Even public prayer should be about the person who is publicly praying, communicating to one person. Yes, so others can follow and agree and follow along, thus the term amen, but it's towards God. It should always be towards God. So it's a single focus with a true and genuine relationship in a familial way, Father. So what else is prayer? Skip down to verse 8. So do not be like them. Be like who? The Gentiles, who are using meaningless repetition. <laughs> For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So this isn't to incite us to say, yes, God is sovereign, therefore I don't need to pray. That's, that's not the point of what he's saying. He's doing this in contrast to something else. The Gentiles were praying verbosely and, and with repetition to try and get God's attention or to manipulate God. So this in contrast says, God already knows. God already knows what you need. So what is this bringing to mind? It's bringing to mind that God is God. And that's important for us to bring in prayer, that God is God. He already knows. He still wants to hear from you. He's your Father, right? There's a relationship and intimacy there. He does want to hear from you. But He doesn't want you to approach Him in a way where you think that you're manipulating him or that you're approaching him in such a way that he is, is somehow hand-tied or unable to answer your prayer. He can do all, and he cares. Approach him in the genuineness of your heart. And again, approach him as your father. So I want to put these thoughts together and just give you a definition. Prayer is an intimate communing with the God who is known as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. Okay, I'll say it again. Prayer is an intimate communing with the God who is known as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. So I'm trying to put a lot of thoughts into this and I'm purposeful in choosing the word communing and not just speaking because sometimes prayer is more than just words. It's so deep and the tears fall so hard that there are no words, but there is a relating between you and God as a father in an intimate, relational way and he must be known. He, he must not be a God that is unknown, but a God who is known. And how do we know who this God is? He has revealed himself in his word. So it's not absent of a knowledge of who he is in his word. If you've ever heard a person pray and thought to yourself, wow, that person really knows how to pray, I, I would ask you to dial back in your mind and consider, is it that their words were so amazing? Or was it that they spoke like they truly knew who they were talking to? I think you'll find that it's the second. That it's a person who speaks as if they know this person. For he is real. And they know him. And how did they get to know him? 
by His Word. And they didn't just academically study it, but they pour themselves into the Scripture because they truly want to know this God who is real, who is really there, who really cares, who is really wise, really good, really pure, righteous, and holy. He's all these things and more as He has revealed Himself to be. So that is what prayer we're going to use as our definition for prayer, an intimate communing with the God who is known as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. So notice, though, what we did not put in our definition. We didn't put a posture in our definition. We didn't say that you have to close your eyes and bow your head and fold your hands. Your eyes can be open or closed. Your hands can be folded or raised or unfolded or at your side or in your pockets. You're, you can be on your knees, on your face, head lifted and, or raised. It's not a posture of your body to the earth, but your heart the Lord. So you can pray while you're doing jumping jacks. You can pray while you're running around. Just don't do it during the service. You can pray at any time, at anywhere. You are not limited ever in your ability to approach and commune with God. In the car, on a trip, when the kids are screaming, you can do it. And when you're in the middle of your workplace and you've got a coworker who asks you about the hope that lies within you, you can pray. And when you are by the deathbed of a loved one, you can pray. And when you receive great news of great joy from loved ones afar or near, you can pray. You can pray. All times and all ways, this is about communing with God. Communing with God. So let's move our thoughts then from what is prayer to how should we pray. And there is no better example of how to pray than what Christ Himself gave us starting in verse 9. It's what we call the Lord's Prayer. And I want to mention as we step into this, there's no problem in reciting this. It's just you don't want to make it so familiar that it becomes something of some sort of repetition where it's uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That kind of thing where it's so familiar you just something that you're quoting and, and not really thinking about. So this is going to give us kind of a framework of how to pray. I'm going to break it up into four thoughts or four groups. Um, our first section is going to be acknowledgments. And then uh, next section will be mindsets. And then next, essentials. And then lastly, kind of the parenthetical statement, a nod. Um, so you can remember that with an A-M-E-N. Amen. Um, acknowledgement, mindset, essentials, and a nod. I couldn't use... Neil, because that starts with a K. I was homeschooled and I did learn how to spell, so that wouldn't have worked in the outline to spell amen. So we'll go with that. So we'll start here. Um, first, I want us to be observant that he says in verse 9, pray then in this way. You'll also, you may notice, in verse 5 it says when you pray. In verse 6 it says when you pray. In verse 7 it says when you're praying. So what does that tell us? Pray. Do pray. There's no question about whether or not we should pray. And what is lost sometimes is if we get overly heady, God sovereignly knows all things. He doesn't really need me. He doesn't need to hear from me. He doesn't need to talk to me. That's false. Our Lord prayed, and here we see Him. It's just automatic. When you pray, when you pray, when you pray, you're going to pray. Right? And the other thing is, He's our Father, Right? And, and I realize that some of you didn't have great fathers, earthly fathers. But, but guess what? There is an even playing field in getting to know our Heavenly Father. Everyone can get to know our Heavenly Father. 
if you had a great father, you know, God, God be praised. That's, that's great. You had a good example. Um, if you didn't have a good father, God be praised. He's used it in your life. You're here. Okay? But what all of the, these people have in common, all of us have in common, is that no heavenly father will ever, ever, ever come close to rightly reflecting the heavenly father. One and only. So get your information about what the, our Heavenly Father looks like from the Scriptures, from how He is and how He's revealed Himself in Scripture. So first, just how to pray? We are to pray. All right. So we get three acknowledgments. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Okay, so three things. Our Father, this first one, I've already kind of looked at this thought, um, God, if you know Him, is our Father through Christ, if you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, God is your Father. You can approach Him as your heavenly Father. What a blessing. And we should want to talk to Him. Okay? So God, we pray our Father... And then it's who is in heaven. I'm reading from the NASB. If you might be used to hearing this from the King James. Um, our, our Father who art in heaven. Um, a little different language, Old English. So this who is in heaven. I remember as a kid, this statement kind of put God somewhere out there. Up there in heaven. And um, that's... That seems very out of sync with the phrase that we just had, right? It says, our Father, and then who art in heaven. So it's not close and then pushing back out. So heaven's not this space-time thing. Heaven is where God is. And there's an attachment then also with who He is. Who He is. If you would, turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses uh, one and two, because it uses similar phrase. Right? It says, God, uh, guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather to, than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in your word or impulse in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Now, that should sound really familiar or really close to something we just got finished reading. With don't be like the Gentiles who just pour it out, and the Gentiles, what? Don't know God. Doesn't that sound very familiar, very close? Okay, so he says, there was the guarding your steps as you approach. And it says, for God is in heaven. Here we are, and it says, God, our Father, who is in heaven. All right, so if we connect these statements together, we get not a distance statement, but instead a knowledge of who God is statement. Don't you know who God is? God is God. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign, good, glorious, and the, and the list goes on. So what this is reminding us is as we are acknowledging God as our Father, we need to also re remember who it is that we're talking to. We are talking to God. We don't just leave that in our thoughts. So in knowing Him, we should be seeing ourselves as stripped bare before Him in prayer. He knows. Don't play games with Him. Don't think that you are hiding something from Him. He knows. Don't think that He does not understand what you are going through. Don't think he does not know your needs. He knows them better than you yourself know them. 
He knows these things. So God wants to hear our intimate, personal admiration of Him, not flowery speeches meant to impress Him. He wants to hear our confessions of our deep, known sins, not some sycophantic drivel about how we didn't mean to do it and it'll never happen again. He wants to hear our genuine request and heartfelt needs, not some camouflaged way of saying, I know these are the most holy things to request, God. I love it when I get a chance to be in with my wife, with the little kids, and to hear them pray for their goldfish, for their cat, um, for, for grandma's ailments. And you see, God cares about those things. And, and we think it's trite because to us, it's trite. But there's nothing trite to God. He knows. So even the most simple of person can make the most genuine simple of requests, and that is more beautiful to God than the most eloquent of speeches meant to impress the greatest of all people. Let's approach God as God who is in heaven. Lastly, our Father who is in heaven Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. And again, in my addled ch child's mind, I thought that this was some kind of distancing statement where God was somehow very unapproachable and that I needed to approach this dark cloud of, of God. But again, Coupling that with our previous thoughts, that can't possibly be it. It can't be a pushing away statement. It needs to be a drawing near statement. But it's also one that is accurate of God. Um, the most common association with the word holiness is usually purity. And, and though that thought is there, um, that's not really the thought of holiness. Holiness is is otherness or separateness. And as we've already seen with the way the Gentiles approach God, they approached Him as a man. And the God of the Bible, um, starting all the way from Genesis, all the way through, and all the way through Revelation, God is spoken of, again, as holy. In Isaiah 6, He's thrice holy. And there's a... Uh, a weight to that. God is un unlike anybody else. And that's why we need the Scripture to have God revealed to us. We, we would not know God otherwise had He not condescended to, to show us who He is. And we thank God that He has. And, and His ultimate revelation of who He is was when He sent His Son Jesus Christ into the world, the God-man. He was the exact representation of God's nature, as we are told. So we don't miss the otherness, and yes, there is a purity to God. And, and the reason why we need to bring this into our, our thoughts is we don't want to get lost or set aside um, this uh, God is my Father and somehow start to get flippant with it. To, to approach Him in an irreverent way. Or, or to think of Him slightly. God is, is God. And He is to be reverenced. And, and feared in a way that draws us to Him. Not afraid of, I'm scared of and I want to run away from, but a fear that drives to in a deep love and reverence to God. You see the difference? That's what it should be. It's, it's almost the vision of a, the way a pig farmer would address a king. How would he address him? He would, he would do homage to that king. We're, we're to do homage to our king. 
So these, these help with our acknowledgments of who God is. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to have all of these words in your prayer as you open. What is, what is prayer? It's, a, it's that heart set. It's the communing with God. So it's not the words. It's the heart. Do you have a heart that God is your Father? Do you have a heart that God is God? Do you have a heart that God is holy as you approach Him? And I've heard people start their prayers with singly God. And in that word carries the weight of all of this. So, so don't get tripped up on just words. Again, focus on the heart of this. Our hearts towards God. Right? So now we get into the mindset of prayer. It says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So firstly, whatever your eschatology is, it better have the heart desire that Christ is King and that He is to reign as King. And we all cry as Christians together, come Lord Jesus. Come and reign. Come and reign. Make it right. Set it all right. Put it right. May justice reign. May peace and joy reign. Our heart's cry should be your kingdom come. I hope your hope is not the next president of the United States. That is a very flimsy hope. I hope your hope is not this country or anything in this world, but the one true King. King Jesus. He is Lord. So your kingdom come. That's one mindset or heart set. The next, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't it easy for us to get in the mindset of, of, will you do it this way, God? Will you answer my prayer? Will you do it this way? Will you, will you hear me? Will you get it done this way? And what are we praying? My will be done. My will be done. And maybe we get a little less selfish and say, their will be done. Their will be done. This person's will be done. And it's neither of those. It's your will be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. It's doing a contrast here as it is there. What angel, other than the demon realm, what angel does not do the will of God? Every angel in heaven, their will is to do His will. And so, what should our will be? To do His will. Not my will, but your will. Doesn't that sound familiar? Christ in the garden, as he agonized over what he was about to take, what, what, what he was about to take part in, the cup that he was going to drink from, and he says, Father, if there's any other way, let's do the other way. But not my will. Your will be done. So our our heart set, our mindset in approaching the throne of God should never be my will be done. Let's not tell him how to do his job. Let's not tell him what to do. Let's tell him what's on our hearts instead. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So then that transitions us into what I'm terming the essentials. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So is three different thoughts. First one, give us this day our daily bread. Bread was the living essential of the day. Without bread, you didn't live. Does God know that you need those things? Does He know that you need food? Covering? He knows. He knows you need them. And He tells us, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all of these things, those essentials, will be added to you. We're also told that He clothes clothes the lilies of the field, that He cares for the birds of the air, how much more you and I. And so we ask. And what do we ask for? We ask for what we need. And sometimes, we don't know what we need. And so we ask, help me to know what I need. And we ask, Help me to differentiate what I want from what I need. Because He knows what we need. And He's going to provide us today, today, with what we need today. Don't worry about tomorrow. It'll take care of itself. And when tomorrow is today, we can say, please give me what I need today. What I need to help my family today, what I need for my job today, what I need to honor you today. Give me today what I need. Give us this day our daily bread. And then we move to a very heavy subject that seems to be heavy on the Lord's heart here. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The reason why I say this is heavy on his heart is if you move down to verses 14 and 15, it seems to continue the thought that he's laid out here. He says, verse 14, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So I want to pause here and take a little time to unwrap this because there's a lot here and it is weighty and I get it. And uh, it's going to require some technicalness here. um, I know everybody wants to hear about a little Greek. His name is Demetrius. Anyway. So we will we'll get into a little Greek here to help us unfold the passage a little better. But let us consider what he's saying. First, debt is used here, the word debt. And so uh, we, we could let our minds float towards financial things, financial debt. But in the parallel passage in Luke 11, 4, the common word for Sin is used in Luke, saying, instead, let us forgive, our, forgive us our transgressions or our trespasses. And so what's being talked about when we're talking about debt here is it's the debt of sin. Forgive us the debt of sin. So that's what's to be forgiven, and it's an ask of God to forgive us our debts, And then there's an association as we have forgiven our debtors. And so the English is trying to keep up with what the Greek is saying here to us. So we've got, um, when we're talking about forgive, both the forgiveness that we're asking God for and the forgiveness we are to give, both are in an aorist active tense. or, Or an aorist, sorry, an aorist tense and an active voice. Okay, and so that just means the subject uh, of the sentence is doing something, doing an action, okay? And it's a single action in the past. So both of them occurred there, and we're going to get some ducks in a row, so 
bear with me as we unfold this. But <clears throat> what differs between the two in the case of, of God is that the imperative mood is, is used in the case of what we're asking God to do. An imperative is a do, right? He will do this, all right? Whereas with um, our forgiveness, it's in the indicative, which means there's an indication there's something else that happened. And here's what I want us to not miss, is one is dependent on the other. If you have come to know Jesus Christ, you, you, know, you know what forgiveness is. Because you, you get what you've been forgiven. You get it. You get that. And if you get that, for you to forgive someone else is, is a given. It should be a given. All right? You see how those, those things, those ideas, those thoughts are inextricably linked? Ephesians 4.32. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. But it doesn't stop there, right? Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So it gives us a reason. It says you forgive because you've been forgiven in Christ. So for us to not forgive is to mock the cross. Is to mock the cross. Or to think very little about what I have been forgiven. To say what I was owed to God was very trite. But what this person owes to me is very big. And by George, they need to kiss my feet. But that attitude is exactly what's getting unfolded in 14 and 15. For, for if you forgive others, and this time we're, we're switching to a subjective mood, which means you may or may not do it. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father, Father will forgive you. So that seems to indicate um, one is dependent on the other, Although it's, it's more what we have already seen, the one is indicative of the other. Meaning, if I truly know that I am forgiven, yes, there will be bumps along the way. You and I aren't going to do this perfectly. However, when we finally come to our senses and realize what we have been forgiven in Christ and wake up, we go, how could I possibly not forgive? I must. I must forgive. But here's the thing. The verses 14 and 15, the forgiveness that is listed of God in both verses, for your Father will also forgive you. And then uh, in verse 15, your Father will not forgive you. Those are in a future tense. Those are in a future tense. Now that's interesting. <clears throat> because what it's saying is the indication of how we live our lives out indicates what has happened in the past and also what will happen in the future. And the reason why I want to bring this to our attention is for us to overlook this and say forgiveness is no big deal is to blow past this passage without thought because it gives grave warning that there is a judgment coming and it will rightly fall on my head if I won't forgive. And the reason why I won't forgive is because I have no idea what forgiveness is. And the reason why I don't know what forgiveness is is I've never received it. It's indicative of whether or not I really know Christ. James 2.13 speaks to this. 
And it speaks of a heart that contains no mercy and has never known mercy and therefore will show no mercy and in the final judgment will receive no mercy. So I'm so emphatic about this because I want you to know Christ. This isn't messing around. This is soul business. If we're not forgiving, this is soul business. If you sit here with a grudge to a family member, a friend, or anybody, I know there's these cutesy resolutions that say, I'm going to do better this year. Don't do better. Come to Christ. Come to Him. Come to Him humbly. Bow your knee to this God and forgive. Because you'll know first and foremost what it is to receive forgiveness for the wretched sinners that we are. We deserve hell. We deserve separation. We deserve damnation. And in Jesus Christ, in this cross that is empty because we serve a risen Savior, He is saved. Go to Him. Go to Him now. Go to Him in prayer. And commune with this God to know, I have a heart of unforgiveness. God, forgive me. Forgive me so that I will forgive. Forgive. So that when that king comes that we talked about, thy kingdom, we see him in the air, you won't cast down your head and say, oh no, what have I done? But you with lifted voice, lifted hands will receive such a savior to say, our king, my king, my lord, you are here. And I'm here to serve you for all eternity. So forgiveness is weighty. Forgiveness matters. So I also want to address in this thought of forgive us our debts that we're also called to, as Christians, confess our sins. There is a, and I'm going to call it this, heresy out there that says we don't need to do this. That that Christ has forgiven us and we don't need to confess our sins. Yet 1 John 1.9 is very clear. Very, very clear. The confess sins is a present active. It's It's a ongoing doing that we do And confession, the word confess, means to agree, to be in agreement with. And 1 John 1, 9 describes a Christian, a person who says, I have sinned, you have convicted me of it, conscience-wise, spirit-wise, and I am in agreement with you. I don't want that. I want what you want. Thank you for your forgiveness says he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins thank you that you cleanse me from all unrighteousness the guilt the shame that the conscience brings is washed away only can be done by one person god himself can't be done by your priest can't be done by your relative friend can only be done by god so we are called to confess our sins And we do so when we have sinned, we can go to him and say, I agree. And he forgives. It's paid for. It's paid for. He forgives us our sins. He's faithful. He's just. 1 John 1.10 warns of a different person. If we say that we haven't sinned, We make him out to be a liar. And the truth is not in us. So this is the person that says, yeah, I'm being convicted 
of something. But no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I wasn't wrong. So who does that make wrong? God. And we make Him a liar. We should shudder to think of ourselves ever calling God a liar. He's the only one true. So I want us to be warned of this heresy. If you hear it, you don't need to confess your sins. Reject it. It is heresy. We confess our sins. And we receive forgiveness. All right. So let's move to our next thought. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, This is the more difficult of the things to unfold because we know, James 1, 13 and 14, that God doesn't tempt. And then in Habakkuk 1, 13, God is not evil. So why would we ask something like this? We would ask something like this because it's consistent with the heart of God. We should want what He wants. This is not the same as trials, by the way, difficulties that we face that He uses to grow our faith. We're not asking that no trials befall us. That would be to ask something not in accordance with the will of God because trials produce perseverance in our lives. James 1 again. So it's not that we ask for no trials, it's that we ask for no temptation. We do not want to sin. Right? First John uh, 2 John 2.1 says, Little children, I write these things that you may not sin. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Our heart's desire as believers, as children, our prayer to Him should be, God, I don't want to sin. I don't want to do anything to defame Your name. May I not. Please, may I walk in a way that honors and reflects You. May I be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. That should be the prayer. So that brings us to our last piece. Uh, in your, most of your Bibles, this is probably parenthetical. And the reason why it's parenthetical is because it's not in the oldest of manuscripts. It says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, it also does not appear in the parallel passage of, in Luke 11. <coughs> However, we don't cringe or worry about this uh, because these statements are accurate with the character and nature of God. Revelation 4.11, it's abundantly clear that all glory and power are His. So this statement about power and glory being forever, accurate. 1 Corinthians 15.20-28 also states that, it is, that the kingdom uh, is His and all rule and authority is His because He has risen from the dead and He is worthy. He's worthy of it all. So for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Though it might not be in the original text, we can pray it in agreement because it's biblical. Because it's true of our God and our King and our Lord. So I want us to just now transition our thoughts to just some observations. Right? So we talked about what is prayer? How should we pray? So how should we pray? Remember, it doesn't have to be these exact words. It needs to be this heart. This heart, okay, in communing with God. Right, so now we're going to move to some observations about prayer. So first, um, if you know God, let's pray that way. If we know God, let's pray that way. Pray to the God that you know. Not to a God that you don't. God that you know. But I don't know all the neat, fancy words. That's fine. Who, who, who are you trying to impress? Use simple words. Use basic, simple words and talk to God. Don't worry about your vocabulary. Be the five-year-old. That's fine. It's beautiful. Right? 
And if you've got a doctorate degree, don't let that get ahead of you. God blessed you with a great mind, great, don't overuse it or abuse it. Come to God like we know him. Second, and I want to be mindful of this. If you don't know God, if everything that I've said doesn't make any sense to you, you can know God. You can know this wonderful, beautiful Savior. Know this, that you and I are not good. We're, we're what the Bible calls sinners. We've missed the mark of holiness and perfection. We don't have it. And what we're missing is a relationship with God. That's what spiritual death is. We're separated from Him. But Jesus Christ came, born a man, to die for sin, rose again to declare that it's all true, everything that He said. It's all true. He has ascended and is at the right hand of the Father. And He is coming again. You can know God through Jesus Christ, through His finished work. Through His finished work. And you can know Him now in your heart, in prayer, even now. If your heart attitude, your heart cry is, I want to know you, God. I am a sinner. Save me. If that's your heart attitude, you can come to God now and you can know him. And I pray that you can. Third, given all that we know about the character, nature, and power of God, shouldn't we be praying first and doing second? instead of an attitude of, uh, we've done all we can, now all we can do is pray. We, sound, we make prayer sound trite that way, like it's some last resort. It should be our first. God hears, God knows, God's all-powerful. Let's pray that way. Um, fourth, we should pray frequently. First, uh, Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray always, pray continually. Um, what does that mean? Pray without ceasing. I can't pray all the time, but you can commune with God all the time. Now, does it make sense why we find it that way? That's the call. Commune with God always. Can I do it at work while I'm doing my work? Yes. Yeah. When I'm washing the laundry, yes. Taking care of the kids, changing a diaper, yes. Let's commune with God continually. Fifth, uh, we should pray reliably. Ephesians 6.18 tells us to pray in the Spirit. Let's pray in agreement with the Spirit of God who resides in all believers. Let's pray at all times in the Spirit. Sixth, we should pray intentionally. We should pray intentionally. Um, Paul in Ephesians 1, 18 through 21 prays that the eyes of, of the heart might, might op be opened, that we might know God. We should, we should pray with purpose. Um, try adding a so that to your request. God, I pray for so and so, so that they may, might glorify and honor you. Praying, God, please give me a Ferrari so that my friends will see it and know that you're God? Probably not going to work. Okay? So, let's pray intentionally. We have, a, um, we have an all-church prayer meeting that's usually announced in the bulletin. Um, and I, I realize that people can't always make it to those. But we could try, as an idea, we could try to be intentional about saying the subject of our prayer meeting tonight will be 
church planting, sending missionaries. And, and so if you can't make it here for those prayer meetings, maybe you can commit then to pray intentionally with the hearts of the people that are here for those things so that as a church we can beg and plead and be intentional to our God and Father that He might be honored so that we as one church heart together can pray these things. Pray intentionally. Seventh, um, let's pray earnestly. In Luke uh, 22, 31 to 32, that's where um, uh, Christ tells Peter, hey, Peter, um, Satan has demanded that you be sifted, but I have prayed for you that your soul will, will, will stand. The word for prayer is not the, the typical Greek word, prosyukamai, used for prayer. It's, it's the Greek word for, for pleading. And so what Christ did is he pleaded for the soul of Peter. There, there was an earnestness. There was an intensity to it. I, th I think we've kind of lost that societally. There's no earnestness to our prayer. So let's pray earnestly as well. And so just lastly, um, I've used an acrostic here with our, just our outline, W-H-O. So what is prayer? How to pray? Observations on prayer, W-H-O. If you take anything away from this morning, you know, if maybe you nodded off for 90% of this, and you just woke up, prayer is to who? To God. That's right. So let us remember that prayer is to God. So I'm going to close with this anecdote from the life of Fanny Crosby. She was a famous hymn writer. Fanny Crosby, though blinded in infancy, greeted friends and strangers alike and cheerfully greeted them, God bless your dear soul. And according to her own statement, she never attempted to write a hymn without first kneeling in prayer. If this be true, Fanny Crosby spent considerable time on her knees. She wrote no less than 8,000 songs. Miss Crosby was often under pressure to meet deadlines. It was under such circumstances in 1869 that she tried to write words for the tune composer W.H. Doan and sent her, had sent her, but she couldn't write. Then she remembered she had forgotten her prayer. Rising from her knees, she dictated as fast as her assistant could write the words for the famous hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. But one day in 1874, Fanny Crosby prayed for more material things. She had run short of money and needed $5, even change. There was no time to draw on her publishers, so she simply prayed for the money. Her prayer ended. She was walking to and fro, trying to get in the mood for another hymn. When an admirer called, greeting the stranger with God bless your dear soul, the two chatted briefly. In the parting handshake, the admirer left something in the hymn writer's hand. It was five dollars. Rising, <clears throat> rising from a prayer of thanks, the blind poetess wrote, all the way my Savior leads me. So brothers and sisters, friends, may we pray earnestly, intentionally, and frequently to our God who hears, who cares, who knows, who is sovereign and is working to accomplish His good pleasure. Let us pray. God, much has been said, but it's your word that is profound and speaks to our hearts. As your spirit has moved, may you continue to move and work in the hearts of those who are yours, 
to grow them into your likeness. And God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, please, would you open their eyes now and their ears now that they can see and hear, that they can truly know you as God, so that they can know the peace that surpasses all understanding in you. Please, I pray. God, I pray that we would go in this new year God, please, may we be found more, more at your throne, more praying to you, more pleading. God, please, may we be found to be your children as those dependent on you utterly and completely. I thank you, how I thank you for Jesus Christ, for his finished work. Thank you that we can be right with you. Thank you that all that we have is in you. That all that we need is in you. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.